Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Hey, welcome to Go Church. I'm Pastor Barry, and we're excited that everyone's here this morning. We've been waiting for you. It's good to have you. Let's give all of our first-time guests a big hand. Welcome. Welcome to our first-time guests. Just like the video said, there's a connection card inside of your worship program, and we would love to connect with you. If you would fill that out and take it to the tent that's just outside in the courtyard, we, uh, we have a gift that we would love to give you and uh, just bless you with, and it's our honor to have you. We know it's hard to go to a church for the first time that you don't know anyone or, or uh, you're walking in and you don't know very many people. It's tough. So we applaud you and we welcome you and, and we're so excited to have you. Let me, let me say this on the first and on the front end. Today, we're going to eat some barbecue. And we're going to have great fellowship. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be out at Moss Park. Uh, I expect eating to start somewhere between 12.30 and a quarter to one. For that to happen, all you folks that made your incredible meals, get it there about 12.20, okay? Uh, there's a little bit of a charge to get into Moss Park. And let me say this, if you didn't know that the picnic was happening today and you're saying, man, I would go if I would have fixed a meal or a dish or a dessert, can I tell you that we're going to be okay. I promise you, we're going to have enough food. And you're not going to be embarrassed because you didn't bring anything. Just come and honor us with your fellowship. Maybe today's your first time. Moss Park is at the end of Moss Park Road. And bless us with your attendance. We would love for you to come and hang out with us. Everybody, <clears throat> go home, get your shorts on. Grab a chair and bring it with you, and uh, don't forget the kids, okay? Bring them with you, and we're just going to have a great time. Uh, I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you guys made some chocolate and peanut butter something? Uh, uh, thank you. I, I, God bless you. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, some of you folks, you know I like chocolate and peanut butter, so, you know, that Reese's Cup, whatever, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, hey, we're in the middle of a series, and, and actually, we're at the end of it. Today's the last day of this series, and it was entitled, Taking Up the Towel. See, we live in a world where everybody pursues titles, and I want to be the VP of this, I want to be the president of that, and it seems like it's all about the pay grid, and it's all about the title, and it's all about your position, and and. Jesus comes in on the scene, and through his word, he teaches a totally different style of leadership. And he, he challenges his followers to be a disciple and to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He tells us, you've got to take up of a towel. We know the story of, of the last meal that Jesus has with his disciples. He, he prepares the Passover meal. And he eats it with them, and he institutes communion, the Lord's Supper, breaks the bread, passes the cup of the juice. He says, this is my body broken for you. And at that, at that meal, he also does something that's just so crazy. We're talking about the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of all creation. He stoops down to the lowest of level. And he washes the disciples' feet. See, that's what taking up the towel is all about. It's following the example of Jesus to serve. Remember, we said that uh, the world's visual of leadership is a triangle. And that everybody's climbing over top of everybody else trying to get to the top because the person at the top is most important. The person at the top gets paid the most. And the, mo and the person at the top has the greatest significance. And Jesus tells us this. He tells us that the greatest among you will be servant of all. So what Jesus does, he takes that world's model and he turns it upside down on its head. And he puts 
the greatest leader on the bottom of the triangle, and he says the greatest leader is the one that serves everybody else. And really, he tells us that the reason why we're given authority, the reason why we're given responsibility, and the reason why we're given power is to better everybody else and to serve everybody else. To this type of leadership, that is what God has called us to. And, and we have talked about it, that it's a matter of the heart, the head, the hands, and habits that we have. The heart is what you genuinely, truly worship and love. What is it that motivates you? Being a servant leader has a lot to do with your mind and how you think. That either you are a self-servant leader or you're a servant leader. And then it was the hands, the things that we do with our hands. How do we serve one another? And, and then last week we talked about the habits. And the habits that we really looked at what Jesus did is that he got his power for spending time with the Father in prayer, in solitude, in getting in the Word, that those were the things that gave him the power. Those habits that he did day in, day out, is what gave him the power to produce the fruit of a humble servant's heart. So God's people need to be different. So God's people need to be different. We have got to be the light of the world. I'm telling you, if you take this mentality of a Christ servant style of leadership into your home with the way that you relate with your spouse and children, if you'll take it into the workplace, if you'll take it to school with you, if you'll take it to your neighborhood and, and realize that I'm here to represent a holy God and to serve Him and to serve others, I'm telling you, it will be transformational not only to you, not only to your family, but to the world. I believe, here's your first blank. On the back of your worship program, my notes are there. And on the back, I have several blanks. If you would fill in your first blank. I believe personally that servant leadership is about being a servant, not doing service. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, how do you be a servant without doing service? I'm saying that it's a matter of who you are rather than what you do. See, if you're a servant at your heart and you're not trying to promote yourself and you're not trying to exalt your own agenda, and I would put it this way, if you're about building your own kingdom, that's not being a servant. That's being a king or Maybe some of our spouses would say it's about being a dictator, a monarchy. God has told us that it's more about who we are and coming to God and asking Him to change who we are. That's what servant leadership is all about. It's about being a servant rather than just doing service. It is, it is that back to what we talked about. It is a heart, hid, hands, and habits issue. I, uh, I got an incredible story that we're living right at the moment. Uh, one of the greatest servants I know of in my life is my wife. I don't know if she's here or not. Is my wife here? She's not gotten here yet. Okay, so she's going to have to listen to this if she wants to know what it, know what it says. So all y'all tell her, oh, Pastor Barry said the sweetest things about you. <laughs> help me out. You know what I'm saying? How, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I need, I need help every once in a while. Well, my wife stayed up late serving. She, was, she makes the best macaroni and cheese out there. And she was making two huge tubs of macaroni and cheese late last night. My son had to work late. He had this job and he was working really late. So she couldn't sleep anyway. I could sleep fine knowing that my son was out. It's okay. He's a grown boy. He can take care of himself. But mama can't sleep. Everybody understand what we're saying? 
So mama can't sleep. She's making these macaroni and cheese. Son gets home. He brings home some stuff, and, and they put it in the refrigerator. And what, what you do when you make macaroni and cheese, you got this cheese sauce, right? I guess it's got milk and butter and cheese and all that stuff in it. And she had no, no lion. She had a pail of that stuff about this big. And she put it in the refrigerator so that it would keep overnight and everything would be good. And something must have happened. Some of you know where I'm going. And it turned over in the refrigerator. And I, uh, (laughs) could y'all do that one more time? Oh, (laughs) Man, it was horrible. I, I get up at six on Sunday mornings and I go into my prayer time and I got to get a Diet Coke before I go. So I'm reaching into the refrigerator or getting ready to, to get that Diet Coke. And I see this yellow stuff all over the floor. So it seeped out of the refrigerator and it's all over the floor. And what do I do? I clean it up like a good husband, right? No, Christina! Six o'clock. She, I said, wait, tell me what I can do to help you. She's so upset. And she says, well, Barry, you got to preach. You you know, I'll just take care of this. And uh, I don't, you know, this is such a mess. And as she opened it door, it seeped down in all the crevices It's gone into the the vegetable tray. It's gone into the the tray where you put the bottles of water. And it's gone into the freezer because our freezer is on the bottom. And so she's cleaning all this up. And she would not let me, she would not let me help because you got to preach. You got to preach. You got to preach. You got to get ready. You got to get ready. She wouldn't let me help. And she's literally down on her knees cleaning this mess up crying. I mean, just broke my heart. Just broke my heart. And, uh, and then I, uh, I just uh, got my kids, and I was amazed how my kids just went and helped her. Uh, Carly took care of the baby. Uh, Cammie, you know, our baby, Carly took care of her and entertained her in the morning with some Dora the Explorer and all that. And then Cassie was helping mom, and Kayla was here on the worship team getting ready. Josh was here moving the trailer and setting up, uh, help setting up the children's ministry. So every one of my kids, they were helping mom, they were serving, and, and I just think that's an incredible picture. You know, Satan was coming after and trying to discourage her, and, and you want to hear that even what was on top of it? We have one set of keys to our car. And I took the keys with me to church so she couldn't come. I had to give my keys, her keys to Joshua. He had to drive them back to mom so that she could even get in the car and come here. That's crazy, isn't it? Isn't it crazy? I mean, how many of you can say, I've had some mornings like that. I know many of you could say that. Many of you could say that. But it's amazing how my wife just takes up the towel and serves her family. And to every woman, to every father, to everyone that serves their family like that, I just want to say I appreciate it. And I want to say to her, when she listens to this video, I appreciate you, and I thank you for your servant's heart, and I love you, Christina. So let's give Miss Christina a big hand, if you don't mind. She'll definitely be at the picnic and see you there. And uh, we're probably going to have some dry macaroni and cheese, you know what I'm saying? So this thing about servant leadership starts and ends with a a foundational issue that you have got to make a choice. And Joshua had to make a choice with his leadership and with his family. And notice what Joshua 24, 15 says. It says this, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, he's talking to all of the millions of 
Israelites that came out of Egypt, was wandering around in the desert for 40 years. Now they're in the promised land, and he's talking to him. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors serve beyond the Euphrates, beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you are living, that's the people in the, in the promised land. But as for me, Joshua says, in my household, what I'm responsible for and what I can be in charge of and what I can change and determine, but as for me in my household, we will serve the Lord. See, it starts with a choice. Have you made that choice yet? I'm not talking about checking a box saying yes to to salvation and going to heaven. It's more than that. You know, we're told so many times that say a prayer, oh, give your life to Christ, and you'll go to heaven. I believe that's true. I believe that if you commit your life to Christ, if you repent of your sins, and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will go to heaven. But it's not just getting a ticket to ride to the other side. It's not just this easy believism. It's understanding who I am before a holy God. That I don't measure up. That I've sinned and I've fallen short of the standard of God. That he sent his son Jesus to die in my place. And that only through believing in him and receiving him and taking him as my Lord and Savior can I go to heaven. And that's what it's saying. That... Joshua made a choice that Jesus was going to be his Lord. Notice what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. He's like, all right, come on now, I'm begging you. I'm begging you, brothers and sisters. And he says, here's here's what I'm talking about. In view of God's mercy, because Jesus was beaten and bruised for you and me, because he was crucified for you and me, and and he went through all that pain and punishment and separation from the Father. In view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your true and proper worship. And it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. He says, be a living sacrifice. Do not conform to the world. Isn't it odd that he's not calling us to die for him? It's not a dead sacrifice, lay on the temple and and be sacrificed and killed there, but to live every breath, every step, every thought, word, and deed as a sacrifice, like, like incense, a act of worship offered up to a holy God. And to do that, I must turn my back on this world and the things of this world and the attitude that could be Maybe put in a nutshell as pride and self-promotion and self-servingness, if that's a word. Spencer, see there, I made up a new word. It's turning our back on this world, and and it's being a sacrifice to live for God and not do what you want to do. Well, what do you want to do? I want comfort, I want pleasure, and I want it like Burger King. I want it my way. We all do. But when we choose to alter our, our lifestyle, our, our situation to be an act of worship and obedience to our holy God, that is what he's talking about, is a living sacrifice. You put that verse and marry it to this next verse in Matthew 16, And it really challenges how we live today, especially as Americans. Now think about that. Especially as Americans.
said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will be rewarded. He will reward each person according to what they have done. So what does it mean to deny yourself or die to yourself? What does that truly mean? It means I place my desires on the back burner and make it subservient to the desires that God has for me. I seek his kingdom first, not my own kingdom. I die to my flesh and my own desires that doesn't align with the will of God. And that's what it means to die to myself. Well, what does it mean to take up the cross? What does that mean? Well, let me tell you, the cross is the symbol of death. You know, when you wear a cross on your, on, your, um, on your necklace, that's just like wearing an electric chair. Have you seen anybody with an electric chair on their, on their necklace? It's a symbol of death, isn't it? If, if we would have went back in, in the Roman days and, and we were wearing a cross or we had a tattoo of a cross or, or had a cross earrings, they would have thought that was so weird because that was the form of execution. And there was a symbol of death. And what, what is Jesus saying to us when he tells us to take up our cross? See, that cross was a symbol of the ultimate commitment and the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus gave his life in obedience to the Father's call so that we could have a relationship with God. He sacrificed it, it, it all. He gave his life, and for us to take up the cross, it means to take up that type of commitment. That I'm willing to go the distance. I'm willing to give my life for the glory of God and for the furtherment of his kingdom. And I'm willing to be associated with Christianity and Jesus. And unashamed about that, to take up the cross, carry it to work, carry it to school. I am unashamed of being a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to offend anyone by being a Christian or a follower of Jesus Christ, but if me being a Christian offends you, I'm sorry, I ain't going to change. I am what I am, like Papa said, and Paul said it too. I am a follower of Christ, and like Joshua said, I have made a decision. I have determined in my heart. What, what would be the opposite of that, I wonder? What would be the opposite of taking up the cross and denying yourself and following Christ? And being a living sacrifice. The opposite, I think, is the sometimes the American dream. Self-promotion. I heard it say this way one time. And, and let, me, let me pause and say this. Because I don't want to be taken wrong. I don't believe that it's a sin to have money. I don't believe it's a sin to have a nice car and a nice house. I, I want those things for my family, but I think it is a sin if it has you. And that's why you live. And our next blank is this. When we follow Jesus, we have to take him to be our Lord. And he said, Jesus said after he washed the feet, he said, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you and very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now you know these things, you will be blessed to do them. But the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells us to follow this example. He tells us, he calls us, and he tells us that we're going to be blessed 
if we do so. Now, let me ask you, do you want the blessings of this world and the affirmation of this world? Or do you want the blessings and the affirmations of God? What really matters to us? In Matthew 22, it says this. Teacher, what is it that really matters? How do you want me to live? Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus told him, this is what really matters. And if you take the whole Bible and you sum it up to this one thing, it's this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything of the prophets hang on these two commands. Today, I'm calling you to a different type of lifestyle as a Christian. And I don't know anyone better to explain that lifestyle than one of my good friends. His name is Joe White. I, he's one of my heroes, to be honest with you. And I want him to explain the lifestyle that I'm talking about. Would you help me welcome Joe White? Here at Canicut Camps, we've always had a simple motto, and that motto says, I'm third. Years ago, there was a nine-year-old boy who heard the I'm a third talk, which would be traditionally given on one of the Sundays at camp. His name was Johnny Ferrier, and although Johnny was just nine years old, he got it. He got the idea that if you want to be really happy, if you want to really be great with your life, just put God first. Put the other person second and put yourself third. Who would want to be around a person like that? So Johnny became a very well-liked camper. As the years went by, Johnny became a football player at Colorado State University where he was a great running back. Johnny always kept the motto, I'm third, on the football field, off the football field. He was hired as a counselor here at Kanakuk, and the stories go that he was one of the greatest ever. After Johnny finished his college days playing football and being a counselor at Kanakuk, Johnny became a jet pilot for the United States Air Force. His plane was the F-86 Sabre Jet. Johnny fought in a war bravely for the United States of America, trying to promote freedom in the world and protect uh, parts of the world that were being overrun by insurgents. During the war, Johnny continued his simple motto, put God first, put other people second, put yourself third, and you'll be successful, great, and happy. Uh, after the war, uh, Johnny's story becomes a legend, although the legend is completely true. Johnny joined a jet exhibition team called the Minutemen, which was four of the finest jet pilots in the world who would take their F-86 Sabre jets and fly them into air shows all over America, showing the latest technology in, in, in jet uh, travel. One fine day in Dayton, Ohio, at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, there was a show called the National Air Races that attracted about 100,000 followers. The men and men were asked to perform, and one of their key maneuvers in the air show that they did over and over again was called the Fleur de Lis, which was a maneuver where all four planes would fly above the crowd, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 feet above the crowd, wingtip to wingtip with blue smoke coming out of the back of their planes. At one moment, in the middle of the crowd, all four planes would go straight up into the sky, Two planes literally headed straight for the clouds, and then two planes at 7,000 feet taking a right turn and a left turn, making a giant blue flowery cross in the middle of the sky. On this particular day, when Johnny's plane took this screaming left turn, uh, there was a malfunction in the rudder, and Johnny's plane began to dive, to dive into a little bitty town called Fairborn, Ohio, which is just outside of the uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Immediately, Johnny's captain of the, uh, of the squadron uh, commanded Johnny to bail out, and all Johnny had to do was push a eject button, which immediately ejects the pilot. The canopy jettisons, the parachute jettisons, the pilot uh, floats down to safety. But Johnny knew if he bailed out of that plane that his plane would go uncontrollably um, into the houses below, and he would obviously kill a lot of people. So Johnny made a decision. Actually, the decision had been made many years before when he was nine years old. He would put God first. He put the other person second. 
and he put himself third. The lady who was in the house that Johnny's plane was crashing into said in an interview with the newspaper the next day, she said, I was looking out the front window of my house and she said it was like he was looking straight in my eyes. And then just before he crashed into my house, she said somehow he pulled the plane up over my house and she pointed to a gaping, smoky hole in the garden behind her house. And she said he put it there, saving my life, the life of my son. And the only person injured in the accident, of course, was the pilot of the plane who gave his life to save the life of someone uh, he never knew. The I'm third philosophy for Johnny was simple. It came from Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, where in the latter week of Jesus' life, the lawyers really of the day Ask Jesus, you know, if you could sum up the whole Bible into one commandment, what would you say? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And he said, the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, when Jesus allowed himself to be crucified, he was the ultimate example of putting God first, others second, and I'm third. The funniest thing about Kanakuk is watching I'm third kids grow up. It's watching kids like the president of my student body when I was in high school, a uh, big, handsome, uh, dark-haired kid named David. It was time for the senior prom. David had the motto, I'm third. Put God first, put others second, put yourself third. There was a girl who lived across the street from me named Kathy. Kathy had a severe uh, disease when she was a baby girl that paralyzed her face, her mouth, her neck. Kathy would walk down the halls in our high school uh, literally drooling on herself. She couldn't even close her mouth when she walked. Um, no one thought Kathy was very attractive. In fact, the opposite, uh, according to the way people see people, was true. But no one will ever forget the day David humbly, the president of Stew body, walked up to Kathy's house and humbly knocked at her door and said, Kathy, I would be so honored if you would be my date to the prom. Nobody knows what anybody wore that night to that prom, but no one will ever forget the paralyzed girl with the paralyzed neck and the paralyzed face going to the prom with the president of the student body who understood God first, other second, and I'm third. A couple of years ago, a 12-year-old camper came up to me who had this motto squarely in his heart. His name was Jackson. And Jackson came up to me after I talked to the uh, campers about the creation, about how God obviously spoke the cosmos, ordered the cosmos, built the cosmos in a divine design. Afterwards, Jackson came up to me, a little bitty guy, about a hundred pounder, and he said, hey, he said, Mr. White, he said, can I tell you uh, how I led my best friend, Will, to Christ? He was an atheist. And I said, Jackson, tell me. He said, well, every day I would meet Will at his locker. And he said, I would bring him notes of the proof for God, scientific notes of proof for God, like the creation talk I was giving. And after about two weeks of getting the notes, Will got mad. And I said, what happened? He said, well, he said, Will was waiting for me at the locker. And he said, he hit me right here in the side of the head. I said, what, what, what happened? He said, Mr. White, he was twice as big as I am. He knocked me in the hallway, he knocked me on the ground. I said, what'd you do? He said, I went home and got more notes. So the next day, Jackson goes to Will's locker and he puts more notes, proof for God, into this atheist kid's uh, locker. And Will was waiting for him. And he hit him right in the mouth, right above the, uh, his front teeth. And I said, Jackson, what happened? He said, Mr. White, he's twice as big as I am. He knocked me in the hall. I said, Jackson, what'd you do? He said, I went home and got more notes. So the third day, the third day, when Jackson returned to Will's locker with the notes, Will was waiting for him and expecting to get smacked in the mouth. Will said to Jackson, hey Jackson, uh, if your faith means that much to you, if Jesus means that much to you, that you would take my licks to try to get me to know Jesus, I wanna know the same Jesus that you know. So Jackson leads Will to Christ right there at his locker. I said, hey, Jackson, does Will go to church? He said, every Sunday morning and Wednesday night. I said, he does. How do you know? He said, he goes with me. God first, other second, and I'm third. There's a little girl who plays public school basketball just up the road. She's a camper. She got it. She has four Bible verses on her shoes. One of them is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One of them is Colossians 3.23. Do your work heartily as for the Lord, not for man. One of them is Galatians 1 somewhere where it says the same thing as Colossians 3.23. And one of them is in the book of Hebrews in the 12th chapter. that says if you get disciplined by a coach, it's going to hurt for a minute, but in the end it will make more character in your life, basically. That little girl was asked by the Lord in her heart to lead her team to Christ. 
So she started as a freshman, a 14-year-old freshman, leading a Bible study at her locker every game. One girl came. Soon, half the team came. By the end of the season, the whole team came to her Bible studies at her locker. She began to pray for the whole team before games. That 14-year-old girl guided her team to the state championship in public school basketball. But more importantly, she guided them to Christ. When they won the state championship, they printed their shirt like a cross. Champs State. God first, other second, now I'm third. Her sophomore year in volleyball, as a 15-year-old, this little I'm third girl, now goes over to the opposing coaches and she invites through the captain of the team, all the other team, to circle around the court before the game, hold hands, and pray together. If you can imagine, in a public school, putting this into practice. Today, I am seeing it all over the United States of America. Kids are taking seriously the great command of Jesus, following the example of Johnny, but more importantly, the one who loved you enough, even though he was God, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, that he did not hold on to equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus said, if you want to be truly great, become servant of all. That's what it means to be I'm third. And I believe the key to unlocking that greatness is found in this verse where Jesus said, he who humbles himself, I would exalt. But him who exalts himself, I will humble. I think today we have a decision that we need to make. Will we adopt this lifestyle of being a servant that's called, taking up the towel, and I am third? Or will we live for ourselves? And can I tell you, your spouse is watching, your kids are watching. And the world is watching. And they need us to step up and take up the towel. If you're here and you're believing God wants you to make a decision to offer yourself to take up the towel, to ask God to help me live, and I am third lifestyle, I'm going to encourage you to make that commitment. I'm going to encourage you to write on your connection card, I am making the commitment to live. I am third. And just let me know, because I want to be praying for you, because I believe that when God's people take up the towel, and they take up the cross, and they live an I am third lifestyle, that this world is going to explode with desire to know our God. If you're here today and you don't know for sure, for certain that you're going to spend eternity in heaven and you are hearing these words from God and you're hearing about this man named Jesus, he said this right here. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no man can come to the Father except through me. You are created by a holy God. And that holy God more than anything wants a relationship with you. And he did absolutely everything possible that could be done in sending his son to die in your place and to take your penalty upon himself on the cross so that you can live for all of eternity. You must do three things. You must admit that you're a sinner and that you've gone your own way and done your own thing, and that you live for yourself, not for God, you must believe in Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven. That he died for you, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And lastly, you must make a commitment to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. With all heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, 
If you're here and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're ready and sincerely ready to make a commitment and you're willing to lay down your life and surrender. Would you follow through on that by praying a prayer like this, inviting Christ to take over your life? The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So would you pray from your heart to God's heart silently, sincerely? Dear God, I know that you created me. I know that you love me. And I admit that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm separated from you. And I know that I've been your enemy because of living for myself. And I'm just sorry. Please forgive me. Dear God, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die in my place and to take my penalty upon the cross. Today, I'm putting my trust and my faith in what Jesus did to build a relationship with you so that I can live with you for all of eternity. I not only believe that Jesus died, I believe that he rose again on the cross, out of the grave, defeating death and sin and Satan. So Jesus, because I believe that you are alive, and that you are the one way to God. I invite you into my life right now to be my Lord and my Savior. I surrender to you. You are my boss now. Save me. Save me. Save me. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. With your eyes still closed and your heads bowed, as we continue to do business with God. If you're in this room and you believe that God has been speaking to you to make a commitment to live, I am third, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand all over this place. Raise your hand and say, God is leading me to live a different life, an I am third lifestyle, and I need prayer, Pastor. I need prayer, Pastor. All over this place, would you raise your hand if that's you? Dear God, see every one of these hands. Bless everyone that's committing their life to take up the towel and to live. I am third. How many would say, Pastor Barry, I have an unspoken prayer request. There's something going on in my life that I need prayer for. Would you raise your hand? Yes, God sees those hands and he knows what's going on. Yes, Lord. Put those hands down. I want to know, because I want to pray for you, did you pray today and invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life? Did you make a commitment of surrendering to him and and allowing him to take the lead in your life? If that's you, I want to pray for you. Would you just slip up your hand today? Raise it up high. Amen. Amen. All over this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Would you stand with me? With a reverent heart. A heart full of thankfulness. A heart full of praise. Would you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you for what you're doing in your house. I thank you for everyone in this room, every family that's represented. And God, I thank you for your presence here, that you're meeting with us and you're changing us and you're molding us and you're making us into what you want us to be, dear God. Lord, so many people raised their hands today. I pray a special blessing over those who desire to live this take of the towel. I am third lifestyle, God. Help them to be a servant and help them to to live through your power. Minister to their heart. Change their mind. Give them the habits that they need. Bless them, O Lord. And God, I just applaud you, and I applaud you for saving those who raised their hands today and those who cried out to you and invited you to take over the control of their life. God, I just praise you today, and I thank you because it changes everything. 
God, right here in our midst, there's been glory revealed and lives have been changed. And I just give you credit. I give you glory for it. And I believe that the whole family will be changed. I'm believing that this whole community will be changed. May you help your people, God, to finish new business with you this morning. Not to leave this altar, not to leave this church service until they finish their business with you. Holy Spirit, continue to work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you need to come to this altar, it's open for you. If you need prayer, you come. As you made decisions today, please indicate that on your connection card. And you can hand it in as you walk out, or if you're a first-time guest, take it to the connection tent. Would you worship Him and respond to the Holy Spirit this morning? Lead us, man.